Hello, hello. Tara here with Not By Sight. We're on chapter four. And poor, Claire, poor Grace. She's had a rough few days with the Women's Forage Corps. She has not been doing so hot. She can't dig ditches. She sewed bags closed. And all of the pigs got let loose by Claire while she went to go look for some gloves. And then she stumbled upon... Jack betting him from the big party in chapter one. So she's like, what? Um, and she's like, I am definitely going to get fired. And she doesn't want to. Poor thing. So let's see if she can survive this. <laughs> she better. We're not going to have a story. <laughs> chapter four. You know me? Instantly, he was looming over her. He reached out and grabbed hold of her arms while he barked his question through a veil of steel mesh. Grace tried looking up at him, then glanced away. He was gruesome. The mask covered the upper part of his face, much like a domino mask, except the eye holes had been filled in with narrow metal strips, making it impossible to see him. Even more ghastly, an attached curtain of steel hid his mouth and the rest of his face from view. Why did he wear such an outlandish disguise? She couldn't help think of thinking of some eerie, otherworld being she'd seen in picture books. I saw you, she said, frightened by his grip. I recognized you before... before... before you put on that hideous mask. She didn't finish. She did not finish. Who are you? His fingers dug into her flesh. And why did you invade my privacy? A mistake, honestly, she tried pulling away, but his grip held firm. Her memory of their last encounter returned, and Grace could hardly believe he was the same Casanova who had enticed her with his devilish smile and penetrating gaze. She recalled how that smile had faded to a look of rage after she'd handed him the white feather of cowardice, and how he'd left the party without a backward glance. She didn't dare reveal her identity to him now. He seemed angry enough to kill. I... It's the pigs, she said, thinking to appease him with an explanation. I work for the Women's Forage Corps and was taking them to the butcher, but they got loose. One of them ate your roses and then ran into the hedge. He must have decided she wasn't a threat because he released her and stepped back. Whatever the pig's gone, it likely it's found a way out by now. His acerbic tone resonated from beneath the mesh. Yet another instance in which I find animals more intelligent than humans. Grace felt too relieved at having escaped his clutches to respond to his obvious insult. This way, girl. He moved past her, and she followed her, and she followed, her mind still reeling. Jack Benningham was Lord Roxwood, the Tin Man. Not a monster. At least not outwardly, despite his scars. She stared at the powerfully built figure leading her back to what she hoped was the entrance into the labyrinth. Now that she'd seen the mask with its steel veil, she understood why the locals called him the Tin Man. But the rest, the hunchback, pointed ears, and sharp teeth, was the invention of rural imagination. His moral character was still in question, however. Grace felt certain Jack Benningham's soul must be horribly pocked and scarred with the sins of his past exploits. <laughs> Yet he wasn't womanizing or gambling now. The sight of him shocked her anew as she recalled the newspaper report of his receiving only minor injuries from the fire. Being blinded was hardly that. I trust you can find your way back from here. Abruptly, he'd halted and turned. Grace, nearly colliding with him, Quiet, quickly stepped back. They had reached the entrance to the hedge maze. Fleetingly, it occurred to her that he'd managed to navigate it without being able to see. Yes, thank you, Lord Roxwood. He was surly and rude, and she was eager to leave his presence. I'm terribly sorry about the damage to your roses. She started to walk past him when he reached for her again. She gasped when she, he latched onto her wrist. I believe you've forgotten a small detail. His tone held an edge. You said you recognized me, and that you work for the Women's Forage Corps, yet you haven't told me who you are. Clearly not some farm girl. His grip intensified. Too much good breeding in that speech, miss. He leaned close, 
the horrid mask inches from her face. Grace thought her might, heart might stop. She considered lying to him, but to do so would make her as much a coward as he'd been. She wasn't sorry for handing him a white feather at the ball, for unlike Jack Benningham, she was a true patriot of her country. Straightening her spine, she said, My name is Grace Mabry. He reared back as if she'd struck him. Releasing her wrist, his breath came rapidly behind the mesh. As Grace watched the agitated rise and fall of his chest, real fear began to take hold. Did he mean to do her harm? Then just as quickly as he ju then just as quickly he recomposed himself. He leaned forward again, menace coloring his tone. Well, Miss Mabry, he spat her name as though ejecting day old tea. I think you've inflicted more than enough damage for one day. Now get out. Grace choked on a cry as she whirled from him and ran all the way back to the gatehouse. Perhaps she'd been wrong, and he did have sharp teeth and howl at the moon. Jack Benningham knows something, though. But what? I don't know. We'll find out. In her distress, she didn't register right away that the cart was gone and the pigs vanished. She was too thankful having escaped the man in the abominable mask. She had ex expected his annoyance, even his anger, as he must certainly remember their encounter from the night of the ball. But his loathing, the rage she'd heard in his voice, jarred her. Shaken, she went inside to change her uniform and wash her face. Afterward, she grabbed a bicycle and rode to the barn. The cart stood out front, the cage empty. Claire must be having a good laugh at her expense, Grace thought bitterly, pulling the daisy pendant she'd found from her uniform, uniform pocket. Well, the joke would be on her once Grace offered up proof the woman was responsible. The barn doors opened and Mrs. Vance stepped outside, hands on hips. Before Grace could utter a word, her supervisor snapped. Inside! Grace's heart beat faster. Would she even get a fair hearing? Inside the building's cool interior, Mr. Tillman stood with the others in a half circle as though waiting for her. The farmer wore a fierce expression and tossed away his crutch as he limped toward her. You've done it now, he ground out. The others rounded up the pigs and returned them to the pen. But you, you destroyed his lordship's grounds. He waved his hands to illustrate the chaos she'd wrought. Mabry, Lord Roxwood is furious, Mrs. Vance said. He's already sent word through his steward demanding your immediate removal. The older woman paused, then added, It pains me to tell you this but you're dismissed from the WFC as well. The last straw, ground Mr. Tillman. His suffused features loomed over her. Exactly why women don't belong working on a farm. How could you lose an entire truckload of pigs? Grace trembled with anger. Lord Roxwood wanted her gone? Fine, but she wasn't going alone. She glanced at Claire Danner. The woman stood with arms crossed, wearing a smug look. Obviously, she had no idea she'd left the pendant behind. Grace dropped the necklace to dangle by its chain at her side, making sure her nemesis saw it. What does Claire have against her? It wasn't me. She fully intended to exonerate herself and name the true culprit. After all, if Danner hadn't been so mean-spirited in the first place, none of this would have happened. No runaway pigs, no encountering Jack Benningham, no getting sacked. But then she saw Claire's tight-lipped smirk fade, the mocking gray eyes widen before her features settled into a look of abject terror. Grace blinked, certain she'd misread the woman's reaction. Then Claire moistened her lips and clasped her hands together tightly as though in prayer, and Grace marveled at the woman's changed demeanor. We all have secrets, she remembered Lucy's words from yesterday. Did Claire have secrets, too? Averting her eyes, Grace felt her desire for retribution ebbing. What good would come from demanding Claire's dismissal from the WFC? The woman might be a thorn in her side, but Claire Danner had skills and performed her duties well, unlike Grace, who had proved quite inept. And in truth, Grace likely would have encountered Jack Benningham at some point during her stay at Roxwood, and his attitude toward her would remain unchanged. She considered Mr. Tillman's sprained ankle, her fault, 
and the bungled sacks someone else had to fix. Again, her fault. Perhaps Mrs. Vance was right and she was better suited for another purpose. It wasn't my fault. There were unavoidable ruts in the road, she lied, fixing her attention back on the pale-faced Claire. The lever on the cage must have jarred loose. When I stopped at the gatehouse to fetch my heavier gloves, I didn't notice it, even when I let the even when I let the ramp down to check on the pigs before I went inside. I returned and found them escaped, running across Roxwood's grounds. I tried chasing them. Her voice trailed off, knowing the concocted story made her sound like a complete muddlehead. Pack your things, Mabry. Even if I could change the rules, it's out of my hands. His lordship has ordered you gone in the morning. Mrs. Vance's look softened. The nearest train is at Margate. I'll take you there myself in the cart tomorrow. I'm sorry, Grace. Grace glanced at the faces around her, swallowing an urge to cry. Mr. Tillman retrieved his crutch and leaned against it, looking satisfied. Becky and Lucy, along with Mrs. Vance, eyed her with pity. Agnes shook her head and, with lips pursed, twisted her hands together. Claire stood near the big double doors, clearly stunned. She spun on her heel and stalked out of the barn. It's done, Edwards? Yes, my lord. Jack Stewart and land agent cleared his throat and added, I've informed Mr. Tillman to make certain Miss Mabry leaves in the morning. I believe she'll be taking the ten o'clock out of Margate. Good riddance, Jack growled. Thank you, Edwards. That will be all. Shall I call for your va valet now, my lord? No. Townsend can attend me in an hour. I know it's late, but I don't wish to be disturbed. Of course. Good night, my lord. Hearing the door to the bedroom close behind his steward, Jack Benningham, third Viscount of Wallenford, heir to the fifth Earl of Stonebrook, and, for his present convenience, second Baron of Roxwood, walked unerringly past the opened French doors leading out onto his balcony. The marble felt smooth and unyielding beneath his fingertips as he stood at the rail. He knew beyond the sprawling lawns and breathtaking rose garden, or what remained of it, stood the enormous hedge maze planted by his great-grandfather decades before. This afternoon had been his first venture outside since the accident. Jack congratulated himself that despite his blindness, he could still navigate the labyrinth's twists and turns in order to reach the fountain at its center. Roxwood had been in his family for generations, and he found the simple two-story Georgian-style home a sanctuary against the suffocating attentions of his family, the animosity and revulsion of his fiancée, and the prying, pitying eyes of London society. It was the perfect place to hide, until today. He loosened the ties of his mask, allowing the cool night air to soothe the constant burn of his guard flesh and his anger. Patrick Mabry's daughter was here, invading his privacy. Why? She claimed to be employed by the Women's Forage Corps, yet she destroyed his rose garden and tainted his sanctuary. Had she purposely orchestrated the little disaster in order to seek him out, to spy on him for her father? For the thousandth time, Jack's memory conjured the night long ago when he'd nearly lost his life. At Lady Bassett's costume ball, he had bungled his attempt, his assignment to shadow the disguised enemy agent, when he was pleasantly diverted by a lovely goddess in green, allowing his target to escape. Jack left the ball then, intent to salvage his assignment with MI5, and follow Chaplin. As he reached the London docks, he'd watched his suspect board the Irish merchant ship, Akiona, as she made ready to weigh anchor. He followed, and while the ship cruised toward the mouth of the Thames, he searched below decks for his quarry. The spy had managed to elude him, but Jack found his lair with Chaplin's signature bowler hat tossed upon the bed. A thorough search produced a map of the naval yards, along with a letter addressed to James Heeren, Akiona's cargo supervisor, and written on Swan's tea room stationery. At first, the correspondence seemed innocent. Shipping instructions written and signed by Patrick Mabry, the tea room's owner. But then Jack held it up to the heat of the lantern and saw code written with invisible ink and penned in between the lines of the letter. The plot thickens. 
He'd pocketed the evidence and returned above deck in time to see Chaplin dive overboard. The ship was nearing the mouth of the river, but because Jack had to preserve his newfound proof, he could only watch in frustration while the spy swam for shore. And in the next moment, his world went black. Jack reached with a finger to trace the still tender flesh around his eyes, then drew a line along the ragged scar at his cheek. The explosion had knocked him senseless. He awakened in hospital days later to learn he was one of only four survivors. The cargo ship had secretly carried munitions and was torpedoed by a German U-boat. With his precious evidence destroyed in the blast, Jack was left scarred, blinded, and bitter in the knowledge he'd been lured onto the Akiona. Never would he forget Chaplin's backward glance as he boarded her, or his subsequent escape seconds before the explosion. Patrick Mabry had written the code. Perhaps he and Chaplin were one and the same man. Now his daughter was here. My lord? A faint knock sounded at his bedroom door. A moment, Townsend, Jack called as he quickly replaced the mask. His household staff was under strict orders never to intrude without first gaining permission. Leaving the balcony, he returned to his rooms. Whatever her reasons for being at Roxwood, tomorrow couldn't arrive soon enough. He wanted Grace Mabry gone. Marcus, we need to talk. Jack? Through the cra crackling line, Marcus Weatherford's sleepy exhaustion seemed to vanish. I thought you'd forgotten how to use a telephone. It's been months, man. Good grief, do you have any idea what time it is? Near dawn, I imagine. Jack hadn't slept. Too many questions about Patrick Mabry's daughter and her presence at Roxwood needed answers. It's 3.30 in the morning. Marcus's tone turned tense. Jack, what's wrong? Does something need to be wrong when I call Marcus? Other than the obvious. Jack said irritably. At this hour, yes. Marcus sounded exasperated. Benningham, you've disappeared off the map. No one's heard from you since you left hospital. Even your father calls me. In my telephone to try to find out how you're doing, I have to speak with that old watchdog Edwards. He paused. Is he dead? Is that why you're ringing me at this unholy hour? Edwards is fine. I've called for another reason. Jack relayed to his best friend the encounter with Grace Mabry. Mabry's... Mabry's daughter working for the Women's Forage Corps could be legitimate, but you don't think so, do you? Marcus said. And neither do you. As I recall, MI5 doesn't believe in coincidences. Hesitating, Jack said, Marcus... I think Patrick Mabry sent her here to spy on me. Expecting to hear his friend scoff through the receiver, Jack was surprised when Marcus said, Not good news, old boy. Jack straightened. Why? Can't discuss it over the telephone, Marcus said. Look, I'll verify her application through the Army Service Corps, since they govern the WFC. I'll also do some other checking. It may turn out we're both wrong and her reason for being there has nothing to do with any collusion with her father. He paused. You've been unreachable for so long. I haven't been able to tell you we finally arrested James Heron last week. Caught him passing coded information to a known German agent. The cargo supervisor for the Akiona? Jack gripped the receiver. What did he say? Heron's involved in the same spy ring we've been after for months. I knew it! Now, please tell me the code was sent along in one of Mabry's letters. I'm afraid not, Marcus said. But MI5 still has a man doing surveillance at Swans and keeping an eye on Patrick Mabry's movements. Unfortunately, the trail went cold recently, but Heron's arrest is a boon. Thanks to you, we know the two men were connected. Jack's hopes plummeted. And the proof lies at the bottom of the Thames. It might be Mabry doesn't know that. Excit excitement tinged Marcus's tone. Look, it's just a theory, but possibly he sent his daughter to snoop around. Can you make certain she stays put? I'll check her story, but it might take time, and those hay baling crews move around a lot. Jack bit back an oath. He hadn't thought it through when he demanded her removal. Get back to me as soon as you can, Marcus. I'll handle things on this end. Fair enough. And since we're finally having a conversation... If there's anything I can do, just ring me back with something useful, Jack said before uh, severing the connection. 
The last thing he wanted to hear from his friend was anything that sounded remotely like pity. From the study, he carefully retraced his steps upstairs. Like the hedge maze, Jack had spent enough summers at Roxwood to memorize every door and hallway, along with the placement of every chair, potted plant, or other pieces of furniture in the, in the house. Inside his room, he removed the mask and sat down on the edge of his bed. He needed to figure out a way to delay her departure, at least until Marcus got back to him. Perhaps in the morning, Edwards could obtain something useful from the WFC person in charge at the farm. Jack fisted the steel mesh of his mask. James Heron's arrest merely confirmed to him Mabry's involvement in the explosion. The idea of his offspring remaining on the property, within proximity of his sanctuary, enraged him. Wasn't it enough he'd been thrown from a burning ship into complete darkness, pocked by scars no woman would ever look at without collapsing into a dead faint? Except for Mabry's daughter, he thought savagely. She was more callous than he'd given her credit for, especially if she were here to do that traitor Patrick Mabry's bidding. Enter, he called to his steward, Mr. Edwards. Jack stood in his room four hours later, dressed and freshly shaved, the latter only on condition he raised the steel mesh himself just far enough that his valet could get the job done. At the moment, Townsend was performing the last ritual of grooming, brushing imaginary lint from the back of his jacket. My lord, I was able to obtain her file from Mrs. Vance, the supervisor, Edwards said. Would you like to review it now? Thank you, Townsend. That will be all. Once the valet departed, Edwards began. Miss Mabry hired on with the Women's Forage Corps just weeks ago. She recently attended training at Norfolk before being assigned to Roxwood. Anything else? He'd hoped for some kind of substantial proof she wasn't here by accident. Very little, my lord. Though it says she's qualified in driving a horse transport team, record-keeping, and operating a motorized vehicle. Perfect, Jack said as an idea began to form. Arrange a meeting between Miss Mabry and myself immediately. Excuse me, my lord. The normally unflappable steward hesitated. I thought you ordered her off the premises. Change in plan, Jack said. With Barnes gone to the front, I need a driver for the Daimler. Dr. Black suggested I take the country air. Miss Mabry should suit for the task. Tell her I'll pay the going rate. My lord, are you planning to offer her a full-time post? Hardly, Jack thought. Mornings only. Since her stay would only be temporary, he could manage two or three hours in her presence each day. If it's only part-time work, your lordship, she may not be interested. Jack hadn't considered that. Inform the supervisor to keep her on at Roxwood. Miss Mavery must be available to me every day until noon. She can work for the WFC afterward. Pardon, my lord, but she's been dismissed from the service. After the, uh incident with the pigs. The WFC makes the rules for their workers. Then tell them to unmake them, Jack said with impatience. I undercut the price of my hay and fodder to the British Army more than any other landowner in the district. I hardly think she'll deny they'll deny me such a small fair. favor. Now see to it, man. Yes, my lord, immediately. Once his steward had left, Jack headed downstairs to breakfast. With a skeletal staff he employed at Roxwood, his cook, Mrs. Riley, brought in the meal herself and then left him to eat in privacy. After removing his mask, he poked at his plate with a fork, satisfied to find the fried kidney beans at seven o'clock, two soft-boiled eggs at six o'clock, and a slice of toast and blood pudding at twelve and one. He began tucking into his food. It was the breakfast he had every day and always in the same arrangement. It not only simplified the menu for Mrs. Riley, who had served since his grandfather's day, but it assured Jack there would be no surprises. He found a measure of control in knowing what to expect and when to expect it, a sense of order that the blindness had robbed from him. Yet he set his fork aside as doubts over his new plan dampened his appetite. He'd been somewhat of a tyrant with Miss Mabry in the hedge maze. She might not wish to meet with him. Jack hoped if she was here to spy on him, she would seize any opportunity to renew their acquaintance. If she wasn't, their interview would most likely end up being uncivil and one-sided, much like the memory of his conversations with Violet Arnold. 
No, Miss Mabry would agree to say, stay. He felt certain of it. And then... Retribution ignited in him like a flame, illuminating his dark world. While he no longer held proof she might be seeking, while he no longer held the proof she might be seeking, he planned to turn the tables on her nonetheless. He would use his skills to interrogate her during their time together and extract information, enough hopefully to charge and convict the traitor who fathered her and beat him at his own game. Jack retrieved his fork, seized with new appetite. Surely God would grant him the justice he deserved. Frowning, Agnes stood at the door of their, to their bedroom and eyed her mistress. Dressed in her blue traveling suit, Grace Mabry adjusted the straps on her portmanteau and haversack, both packed and lying on the bed. The look of defeat on her pretty face nearly broke Agnes's heart. She understood the feeling all too well. You're leaving then, miss. Grace offered a wan smile. It appears so. I seem to have a habit of bringing about disaster wherever I go, don't I? Agnes shook, shook her head vehemently. Mrs. Vance really should have given you more time. You aren't used to this kind of work like the rest of us. She went to her own bed and pulled out her bags, her heart feeling like lead. She didn't want to go back to London to the painful memories she'd left there. Still, I'm going with you, she said. Dear Agnes, I appreciate your support, but please don't leave on my account. You seem much happier here at Roxwood. Oh, how true. Agnes felt free here in the country. The air smelled cleaner, the countryside prettier than the dank dirtiness of London's streets. Life here seemed so uncomplicated. Well, where you go, miss, I go, Agnes said, and meant it. Grace Mabry had more than proved her friendship. Not only had she willingly hired Agnes off the streets without so much as a reference, but she'd offered her kindness and respect. Agnes hadn't received those gifts from anyone, including her despicable husband, Edgar, in a long, long while. Not since leaving her mother and sister behind. A wave of emotion seized her causing unexpected tears. I won't leave you alone, she said, sniffing, as she stuffed her cotton nightdress into her bag. I owe you so much. Agnes, please don't do this. Seeing her mistress's look of distress, Agnes pasted on a smile. I'll be fine, really, she said, cinching the straps on her luggage. Perhaps Patrick Mabry would decide to send them to stay with Grace's aunt in Oxford. Then they could escape London altogether. The notion lifted her spirits. "'Are you sure you want to leave?' Grace said. "'I want you to be happy, Agnes. And Mrs. Vance could use your help here with the others.' She sat on the bed and looked down at her lap. "'Even if I could stay, Lord Roxwood wishes me gone.' Agnes paused, still curious over exactly what had happened with the pigs getting loose yesterday. Her mistress had told them the ridiculous story of how she'd all but let the animals out herself and then chased them down, but Agnes felt certain something odd was going on. Like the flower pendant Grace had placed on Claire Danner's pillow last night. And then Agnes and her mistress had taken their meal upstairs instead of sitting with the others. When the rest of the women finally came upstairs and readied for bed, Claire had turned white as chalk dust seeing the necklace. Neither of the two women had explained. Agnes could only wonder at it. I think this is a change of perspective in the story. Well, Mrs. Vance is waiting for us downstairs. Grace rose from the bed and picked up her bags. When her maid did not the same, tears burned the back of her eyes. Thank you for your faith in me, Agnes. I couldn't possibly imagine a more loyal friend. She saw emotion return to her maid's expression and tried not to feel guilty about her relief that Agnes would accompany her home. Grace imagined her father's reaction. She felt certain he would send for her, her aunt and then wire his protege in New York, forcing her hand in marriage. It seemed she was a complete failure at anything else. Downstairs, the others sat around the kitchen table, looking as uncomfortable as they had the previous night. Grace was glad that at least her last meal at Roxwood had been a peaceful one, with just Agnes for company. 
Since yesterday's fiasco with Lord Roxwood, tensions seemed to be running high in the WFC. Mrs. Vance rose from the table and came to her. This is a sorry business, Mabry, but the WFC has strict rules. I hope you understand. She offered a hand, and Grace took it. It's all right, Mrs. Vance. You're just doing your job. The supervisor looked relieved, then looked to Agnes. We're sorry to see you go, Pierpont, though your allegiance to Miss Mabry is commendable. Miss Grace has done so much for me. I would not leave her. Agnes tilted her chin bravely, bravely, and Grace felt a surge of warmth for her friend. Her words also seemed a catalyst, as soon the others rose and came to murmur their best wishes. Clara was notably absent. Grace recalled the woman's subdued mood last night when she'd found the pendant necklace returned atop her pillows. Well, perhaps she would think twice before picking on any more recruits. "'I'll remember what you told me, Grace,' Lucy reached to offer her a hug. "'One day I can d do anything.' Grace smiled, despite the heat against her cheeks. Her own ineptness made a mockery of the words. Even so, she offered, That's right, Lucy. Never forget it. Neither should you, Grace. Lucy shot her a knowing smile. You just needed a little more t time, that's all. Grace nodded. She would miss her new friend. Waving a last farewell, she followed Agnes and Mrs. Vance outside to the cart that would take them to Margate Station. She gazed at Roxwood Manor for what would be her last time. Jack Benningham's image rose in her mind, and she bit her lip, recalling his hatred. She refused to regret her actions toward him in London, and his behavior yesterday had been reprehensible. Still. Despite what he once was, a playboy, a gambler, a reckless ne'er-do-well, the scars had undoubtedly penetrated his heart. He was a man no longer himself but the brunt of local gossip, the wildly concocted tin man. Hiding away in his self-imposed prison, shunning the world and all it had to offer. Even without her good Christian upbringing, Grace might pity him. She sighed. So much for her story about the mysterious Milord. The only one she'd be writing about was a ninny of a young woman who thought she could work on a farm. Mrs. Vance! Miss Mabry! Mr. Tillman hurried up the track on his crutch. Wait! he cried, wheezing for the effort it took to reach them. Miss Mabry! The land agent, Mr. Edwards, wants a word. He leaned against the crutch, trying to catch his breath. Grace's insides nodded. Was she to pay for Lord Roxwood's damaged rose bushes then? Did he say why? The farmer shook his head. You're to get up to the house straight away. His look of vindication breathed life into Grace's fear. She glanced at Agnes, then Mrs. Vance. Grace, you'd better go and see what he wants, Mrs. Va Vance said. We'll leave when you return. Taking a bicycle, she pedaled up the long gravel drive to Roxwood Manor. Lifting the door's crested brass knocker, she banged it several times before an aged, sour-faced man in butler's attire finally answered. His roomy gaze traveled first to the bicycle, then settled on her. A slight frown formed beneath his beak of a nose. My lord isn't receiving guests. Unaccustomed to such haughtiness from a servant, Grace tipped her chin and said, I am not here to see my lord. I have been requested to visit with Mr. Edwards. It's all right, Knowles, a man's voice called from the interior of the house. Please allow Miss Mabry inside. Lord Roxwood is waiting. Lord Roxwood? Grace barely acknowledged the butler as he sketched a bow and stepped back to let her enter. A small middle-aged man in a charcoal suit stood at the foot of the stairs. Miss Mabry, welcome. I am Edwards, Lord Rock Roxwood's secretary. Secretary? You have many titles, Mr. Edwards. I was told you were the land agent as well. And Lord Roxwood's steward, he smiled. We accommodate a small staff here at the manor, so his lordship can enjoy the pri level of privacy he requires. He indicated a part of the house beyond the stairs. This way, please. Wait. Grace hesitated. Lord Roxwood wishes to speak with me? All in good time, Miss Mabry. Edwards turned and took the lead. Anxious, Grace followed him down a lushly carpeted hall. 
Above the dark mahogany wainscoting, red and gold fleur-de-lis pa wallpaper rose along either side. She noticed a trio of paintings, sailboats, each slightly different but obviously intended as a series and cast in ornate gold frames. This way. The steward halted beside an open door. Cautiously, Grace entered the room. Clearly it was a man's study. More mahogany paneling lined the walls, and on either side of a stone fireplace stood floor-to-ceiling book bookshelves filled with volumes. At the far end sat an expansive cherrywood desk and a pair of leather chairs facing it. Gold drapes covered the single large window along, the, along one wall, and the room was dim but for two sconces mounted near the door. Mr. Edwards moved around the desk and waved Grace toward one of the leather chairs. "'What's this about?' she asked. The study door creaked behind her. "'Miss Mabry?' Grace turned and stiffened at the sight of Jack Benningham's towering frame. "'Lord Roxwood,' she said, rising. "'You wish to speak with me?' He stepped closer and reached for the back of the chair adjacent to hers. I understand you're leaving us. Anger flared in her. He was the one who had all but tossed her out. Thanks to you, sir. Why have you sent for me? I wish to hire you. I understand you have experience in auto operating an automobile. She blinked. He wanted to hire her? The woman who had publicly, publicly shamed him at Lady Bassett's ball? "'Yes, I can drive,' she said slowly. "'Good. It's settled, then. Edwards will fill you in on the details. Call for me at nine o'clock tomorrow morning.' Releasing his hold on the chair, he turned to exit the chamber. "'Excuse me,' she called to him. "'You ordered me off the premises yesterday, and now you expect me to work for you as your chauffeur? Shouldn't you at least ask me if I want the position?' Jack Benningham turned around to face her. Grace averted her gaze from the horrid mask. Well? His tone held an edge of hostility. Do you? She made herself look at him. He was up to something. His reaction to her name yesterday made it clear he recognized her from the dowager's costume ball. Perhaps it was some kind of trick to extract revenge for shaming him publicly, or he simply wished to humiliate her, making her become, for all intents and purposes, his slaves his slave. What are your terms? she asked. His posture eased. Mornings you'll spend driving for me. Afternoons you'll return to your duties with the other workers. I no longer work for the WFC. Yes, I was told you got the sack. His voice held no mockery. The problem has been taken care of. She glanced towards Mr. Edwards, who nodded. Hope rose in her. If she stayed on, she could continue to help in the war effort. She could also remain on her own. Yet, if she accepted the terms, she would have to look at the hideous mask every day and tolerate Lord Roxwood's bullying manner. Well, Miss Mabry, a simple yes or no will suffice. She took a deep breath. I accept. Freedom in helping her brother outweighed this man's arrogance and bad manners. Until tomorrow morning, then. She watched as he swiftly departed the study. Um, so the mask that Jack is using is um, what World War I tank drivers and operators would use um, to protect their faces from uh, shrapnel that entered into the tank kind of creepy looking. I'll uh, share a picture with you at the end of this video. But, hey, she gets to say. So, the story continues. <laughs>